it's great to see um, amazing, amazing audience. Uh, we are sold out. So uh, I'm, I'm, uh, thanks for joining here. Uh, I'm, I have the pleasure of introducing you to the next session. Uh, we will start right away. Uh, and the session is on uh, speech-enabled uh, assistant, uh, a pretty hot topic these days. Uh, and we thought we'll start right away because uh, the panels uh, we have lined up for you is so riveting that you probably will forget a bio break. So uh, let me introduce um, TM Ravi, who will be moderating this panel. Um, TM uh, Ravi is a managing director of um, The Hive, and he's also the co-founder. It's a very unique incubator. Uh, it's a studio to uh, co-create, fund, and launch uh, data-driven uh, startups uh, in the enterprise space. So with no further ado, please welcome uh, TM Ravi to the stage. Thank you, Apurva. And first, I'd like to kind of congratulate uh, Zhengling and Apurva and all the rest for such an amazing conference. So thank you all. So I'm, I'm pleased to be moderating kind of the next session. And this is going to be on voice-enabled personal assistants. So we'll start with three 20-minute sessions. Uh, with Lee Deng, Adam Coates, and Nico Storm. Nico, if you're around, if you can come up to the front so we can mic you. So we'll first start with Lee Deng, uh, uh, the chief scientist of AI at Microsoft. Lee? Yeah, come yeah. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. So I have 20 minutes to go over a whole bunch of slides. I'm probably going to need to skip some of those. So, okay, so I need to, uh, right here. Yes, so today I would like to talk about this spoken dialogue system. Um, excuse me, yeah, control of this one, which one? Yeah, it's right here, okay, good, 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 good. okay, that makes sense now. Okay, so I talk about three generations of spoken dialogue systems. Um, and sometimes it's called uh, bots that you have heard in these modern days. Uh, now, spoke, so dialogue system has been sort of a technical term for over past about 30 years. Um, and also now, we also call them as conversational UIs. Okay, so there's multiple terms basically denoting the same thing. So you would like to uh, develop an agent that can converse with people, either through speech or through text. So since this session is focusing on uh, voice, so I basically would like to say some, big, some fundamental um, sort of differences between these two types of bots. So it turns out that as the speech recognition technology is improving you know, dramatically over the last maybe five years, uh, the gap between these two types of uh, dialogue systems are narrowing. And this is actually the main message. But on the other hand, uh, under many uh, conditions, we still have speech recognition errors. Um, and the, there are some good opportunities that people can, actually the researchers can take advantage of to benefit the, what's called the integrated design. So this is one of the things that are, at the end I'm going to emphasize a little bit more. So spoken dialogue systems, in some way, you can consider them to be the same as the equal here, what I said, speech recognition plus text-based dialogue system. So speech recognition provides some you know, noisy text input to the text-based system and you can put them together. Uh, that's sort of traditional view. Um, now, if you go beyond this view to think about how to do this kind of uh, integrated design, you actually can do better than just put these two systems in straightforward pipeline. And that's the concept of what's called end-to-end -end learning. So I'm going to focus upon, on this paradigm down the road. 
And on the other hand, um, you know, speech also provides some paralinguistic cues that are missing in a uh, text-based dialogue system. And most of the speech recognition systems don't provide this kind of cue. It just provides the text. So in that aspect, these two systems are not equal either, OK? And finally, depending on different users, speech input may be simpler or if sometimes it's more complex than text-based system. So for me, who knows speech quite well, I tend to use speech in a much more complex form than text because I know that recognition er error may not be so high. And speech allows me to, you know, to provide more information faster to the system. But for most of the people that, you know, some of the uh, user studies we have found, when they use text, you know, based dialogue system, they tend to use more complex, uh, you know, sentences because, well, either because they type faster than they speak, well, that's a little bit unlikely, you know, uh, or, or more likely it's because they worry that speech, you know, you know, recognition typically are not mature enough. They don't want to, you know, especially under noisy environment, they don't want to say too much. So they tend to use the shorter. So depending on different users, these two things could happen either way. So I think for the people who develop speech-based uh, personal assistant, people have to be aware about this. But I do believe that as time goes, as the speech recognition become more and more mature, this gap will reduce. And that's the comment I want to make. And another uh, big uh, aspect of uh, voice-based uh, personal assistant is that narrow domain versus wide domain. So today, due to the time limit, I won't actually dwell too much on this. So, I mean, the whole point of here is that in old days, the first generation or the second generation uh, that I'm going to uh, in, uh, speak in more detail um, down the road, um, speech-based system tend to focus on narrow domain. But now you are seeing that this kind of uh, you know, limitation is slowly open because the maturing um, speech recognition technology with deep learning. Um, so I don't know whether how many people actually seen this. Uh, that was uh, a few several months ago. Um, uh, that was a very nice overview uh, article in uh, Venture Beat that actually summarized this spoken language system. Or, or sometimes well, many actually of those are text-based system. In the, sometimes they call the bots. Sometimes they call conventional UIs. And the landscape is huge. So you have um, you know con concept of a connector to connect your technology to third party. And you have this called the development uh, framework and tools to do that, especially for Microsoft. So about one year ago, um, maybe about 11 months ago, Microsoft you know, made big announcement uh, through our CEO in our build uh, conference. We announced uh, this very big effort about um, a Microsoft bot framework that's intended to use to be used for third parties. And some other companies are doing that as well. So due to the uh, time limitation, I'm only going to focus today about this AI tools, about natural language processing, machine learning, speech and voice recognition. And, and from this perspective, I will, I'm going to survey um, you know, three generations of this kind of technology uh, since about early 90s. Um, so actually, I wrote this article a few months ago uh, so, so today's talk actually is based upon part of this article. So I actually talk about this business, um, you know, value of these bots. And basically, uh, you know, I talk about what's wrong with the app models and web, mo uh, you know, web model and apps models. And that's actually one of the topics we're going to have discussion at the panel. So I'm going to skip that at this moment. And also, um, now there is emerging paradigm, you know, for the mobile U uh, UI where bots really can become a very important and intelligent conversational interface agents between human and the machine. Um, and I actually going to go down a little bit more detail about typing aspect of bots. So basically, I sort of uh, categorize you know, a whole bunch of bots in terms of three categories. One is uh, what's called the social chatbot. Uh, for example, in you know, Microsoft, uh, we developed this Xiao Eyes in China fairly successfully. Um, now in US, you know, we went through some difficulty, you know, since like about uh, 10 years ago, oh, no, sorry, 10 months ago, we had this Tay. Now we've got this new version coming out about one and a half months ago called Zoe. Zoe. 
And the second category is what's called the um, information bot, info bots. It really is just to replace you know, some of the search engines in terms of uh, rather than you know, having uh, the blue links, the info bot really allows the users to use bot to directly get the answer out of uh, you know, the search efforts. Rather than having, you know, having to go click and then go into documents trying to find the answer, it actually directly provides answer to you. And if the original context is, you know, the question is too complex, you actually use the dialogue, maybe two turns, you know, three turns, to clarify the answer and to get the result out more directly. Now, the third type of, um, the third type of, sorry, the third type of uh, bots that I was also spending a little bit time down the road here is what's called task completion bot. Sometimes it's called a goal-oriented bot. It actually would do something for you, okay? In contrast to, in contrast to this uh, social uh, chat bot, where you make, you know, conversation, um, you know, make, you know, users a little bit happy. Um, whereas you are not able to do much. Um, the task completion bot actually does something. And for that reason, typically it requires that the third party to help. Otherwise, uh, you know, there's just too many tasks around. Um, so now I'm going to focus more in terms of technology, bot technology over, you know, last about 30 some years. Uh, most people actually, uh, you know, heard all this, you know, hype just within the last couple of years due to all this big company investment. And whereas in reality, this basic technology has been developed since early 80, uh, actually late 80s and 90s, early 90s. I, when, that was the time when I myself actually participated in all, all this uh, effort. Um, and then I'm going to try to summarize to you about why certain technology move from the early generation to the, uh, you know, the newer generation. What is the reason behind that movement? Um, so first of all, the first generation technology started around uh, late 80s, and it pretty much ended um, you know, in terms of popularity about 10 years ago. Although in many of these commercial systems, people still use this kind of symbolic rule-based system. Um, so I call that symbolic rule or template-based because this type of technology requires that you know, you know, either researchers or developers handcraft grammatical rules or some what's called ontological design by experts. And this is actually uh, analogous to the old generation of AI technology called expert system, uh, ex expert system approach. Um, it's very easy to interpret, you know, the rules, you know, the people, you write the rule, you understand what's going on, so it's very transparent. Um, and that's why some successful, uh, so the commercial product have come up, uh, this type of, uh, you know, system. And it's easy to debug, and also it's easy to have a system update, you know. So if a new thing's coming out, you just write the rule, and then things, you know, can keep going. You know, for example, Siri is one of the very typical use of this, where it came from, so the earlier generation. Um, and of course now, um, you know, technology evolved a lot more. So there are a lot of new things going on there. So it's still in use in many commercial systems. And, and actually I got the chance to talk to a lot of, you know, uh, boss startups, you know, in Seattle area, in other places as well. And they also, you know, many of them still tend to use this um, symbolic rule based system. Although everybody understood that they have to use the machine learning, they have to use the real AI, not that kind of old generation AI. And, but the kind of momentum that um, and Microsoft is pushing very hard to, um, you know, to move into you know, fully AI system. Uh, although uh, you know, mix of technology are still actually the, uh, you know, and sort of integration of different type of uh, technology are still sort of the, um, the kind of trend that you know, commercial systems are using. And partly because different generations of these systems have their strength and weakness. So far, how to bridge them uh, is actually a very big uh, sort of research effort. In a lot of our research uh, activities are focusing on this. So the limitation of the first generation system is that it has to rely on experts. If you don't have experts who knows how to write you know, application, it's very hard to develop this system. It's very expensive to, uh, to, uh, to develop this, this type of system because they tend not to use learning as much as they should. 
Um, it's very hard to scale over domains, although some more recent uh, way of doing template-based system, they actually figured out you know, some heuristic ways of doing uh, you know, a generation. That, that, uh, so this is actually interesting um, sort of direction as well. And they sometimes do make use of data, but the data is used only to help design rules, not for learning. So I'll give you one most famous example. So there are actually a whole bunch of um, you know, universities and gov uh, government agencies, as well as uh, commercial uh, companies in early uh, 90s, developing this type of system. And the system basically is broken up into, first of all, you get a speech recognition, and then you have language understanding component, and that's you know for this particular MIT system here. And that actually, I was participating in part of that work in early uh, 90s. It's all written by symbolic rules, and, and it requires some very very dedicated effort to do it. So dialogue manager here also is written by rules. Um, and because of all this limitation, this type of first generation systems can only deal with the very small limited domains. So at that MIT group, uh, and actually there's a very nice overview paper about this set of technology, uh, which I cited over here. And they actually deal with something like as narrow as Berkeley restaurants, you know, sort of conversation. You ask questions. If you're talking about a general restaurant, you couldn't even do that. I mean, so you have to, because, you know, you have to write all these rules into the system. And also, another very interesting application is airline information service system called ADIS. And, you know, some system, uh, so another uh, a very famous system at that time uh, was called Jupiter that deals with the uh, weather information. You actually, at that time, actually, early, you know, the, even web wasn't very popular. So when I was there, it's been 92, 93. Um, you know, web wasn't even popular, so people used the telephone to, you know, uh, to use this uh, Jupyter system to get inf further information. Um, so the second generation um, uh, bot technology uh, make use of data-driven approach. And of course, you know, the people who work on that, they don't want to call themselves shallow learning, but in reality, it is just conventional uh, machine learning method. So the model uh, used, okay, oh wow, well, wow, the time is really go, go quickly. Uh, actually, the key point is the reinforced learning for dialogue policy actually was developed at that time. That was as early as 90s. Um, so now you are seeing all this uh, reinforced learning, uh, you know, hype. Um, these are just because of the integration, the availability of the deep learning to make it work. So I'm going to skip this, except to mention that this shallow learning-based data-driven approach they are not easy to interpret, they are not easy to debug, but they do have the learning capability. Um, now the problem with this approach is that um, the model and representation are not powerful enough because they don't really, they didn't have all this you know, powerful deep learning. So that limits a lot of applications. So that approach, second, technology, second generation technology, remain mainly as an academic until deep learning arrived which I'm going to, uh, so this is a very nice paper that summarizes um, uh, this second generation technology. It's written it's just about three, or three years ago, right before deep learning entered into bot technology. And that actually, this is uh, Cambridge University. Uh, you know, they, they, they took, they make a lot of great effort um, to commercialize uh, the system. So now, uh, so this startup is called the Vocal IQ is part of Apple. So this is the diagram, a uh, standard diagram, very similar to the previous one, except these components now are learned through, you know, uh, the policy is learned through reinforced learning. Okay, yeah, I'm going to go very quickly. And then natural language component, natural language uh, understanding component is, you know, it's learned through HMM or conditional random field. So let me go quickly. Um, so the third generation is actually replaced the shared learning part into deep learning. Um, so like, Generation uh, two um, technology. Now the data is used also to learn uh, the system, but it learns everything in very much in terms of end-to-end -end learning. Um, and it, uh, it has since about two years ago, it has attracted a huge amount of research effort. So, but still the limitation, you know, remain 
about the, how easy it is to interpret the system, but this is a very desirable problem for commercial application. So I'm, uh, I'm going to go through quickly here. Uh, so let me, yeah, so my, my time is really short here. Uh, okay, let me, let me skip. Uh, so now this is the slide that's important. So how do you formulate this dialogue system in terms of reinforced learning? Um, and then actually, if you design system well, you actually think about what is the state and what is the action, what is the reward, you can actually formulate all three types of bots that I talked about earlier into reinforced learning. And we have done, you know, Microsoft and many other companies uh, and the research group have done a lot of work in this area. So let me skip this since the time is up. Uh, and then we do all this uh, analysis. And then this is, the, uh, you, know, uh, you know, a list of uh, reference that I put in there. Um, I'm, I'm, actually, I'm going to have the slide to use. You don't have to, to go through all this. I'm actually, uh, you know, I'm writing a book about, about this area. So it's going to come out, you know, within a few months. Um, and so research frontier speech versus text-based. So um, uh, actually here I list the three um, research frontiers. Uh, I think the time is up now. I'm going to quickly go over one of them. Give me one more minute. So speech recognition is making big progress here. And this is our latest Microsoft speech recognition, which I don't have to go through. And it actually reached human parity. Now, and there's uh, five areas potential uh, speech recognition breakthrough. And now the point here is that, the final slide, is to show you that now, given that speech recognition become more and more mature, then at this time now, we treat speech problem as not just you know, signal recognition problem, but as an information processing problem. And to, to this end, speech recognition component and natural language component and also dialogue control component all can be integrated in terms of end to end because the paradigm now is adapted through deep learning. Okay, I'm going to stop right here. Thank you. <laughs>